John McAfee, the creator of the McAfee antivirus software, has been found dead in his jail cell in Spain. The Catalan Justice Department telling Reuters in a statement that all signs point to suicide. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. John McAfee, the founder of the ubiquitous antivirus software of the same name, was found dead in a Spanish prison cell late last month, supposedly a suicide. But his wife and others don't believe that. They say the mercurial millionaire would never kill himself. And they might be right to be suspicious. McAfee was a fighter, and although he made his money from software, he was a hard man. For the past few years, he's been on the run, chased by US authorities over alleged tax fraud and manipulating the value of cryptocurrencies, allegedly. The law finally caught up with McAfee in Spain in October last year, and he made it known that he was worried about being killed in his jail cell. When he tweeted this a few days after his arrest, he wrote, know that if I hang myself a la Epstein, it will be no fault of mine. Now, in a moment, we'll hear from his US lawyer, Nishay Sanan, who says there's no way his client killed himself and suspects a cover-up. We'll also hear from author Mark Eglinton, who spent many months talking to John McAfee and is about to publish his biography, No Domain, the John McAfee tapes. But first, a quick look back at the life and times of America's wildest entrepreneur. I'd never heard of a computer virus, and up to that point, I think neither had anyone else. What the heck is this? And then it came to me, oh, I know what they did. They, they, they said, I got some code that really replicates itself. Cool. And I wrote a little program, and that was the beginning of McAfee. John McAfee found dead today in a prison cell in Spain. The founder of the antivirus software that bears his name had just been ordered extradited to the United States on tax evasion charges. He faced up to 30 years in prison if convicted. He was 75, and a wild ride of a life it was. You are a free individual. Free to do and think and believe as you choose. I got to keep the public interest in me, right? John McAfee is the guy who created the first antivirus program. The man made a ton of money in Silicon Valley, lost it all, moved to Central America, got linked to murdering his neighbor, and when he got booted from Belize, he reinvented himself as a cybersecurity guru. You know, the joy doesn't come from the money or the stuff, it comes from what you do. My name is John McAfee and I'm running for president. I'm one of the leading security experts in the world, and so none of the other candidates are. Off the record, did you kill your neighbor in Belize? I did not. Do you know who this is? International fugitive, you've run for president, you're a king of cybersecurity. This is not a normal life. The normal life should be doing what you damn well please, and I do what I damn well please. Do you fear death? <laughs> no, not at all. I have reinvented myself. I tend not to regret anything because no matter how bad something may appear at the time, we all learn something from it and, and it, and it does put you where you are today. As I mentioned at the top of the program, John McAfee's wife, Janice, is absolutely not having that explanation that her husband killed herself in a jail cell. John McAfee was not suicidal. I spoke with him a few hours before he was found dead. We spoke about the court's decision to extradite him to the U.S. It did not come as a surprise to either of us. We were prepared for that decision and had a plan of action already in place to appeal that decision. I blame the U.S. authorities for this tragedy. Because of these politically motivated charges against him, my husband is now dead. His last words to me were, I love you and I will call you in the evening. Those words are not words of someone who is suicidal. Well, let's bring in our guest now, and we have Nishe Sanan, who was John McAfee's U.S. criminal defense lawyer was working closely with the Spanish lawyers who are also representing him to fight 
uh, the extradition charges and the charges against him in the United States. And Mark Eglinton is an author who spent hours interviewing uh, John McAfee, months, in fact, uh, back in 2019, and is about to publish his life story in the book No Domain, the John McAfee tapes. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, Nishé, if I could start with you, um, what was your relationship with John McAfee? My relationship was to represent him in the two criminal cases that were pending in the United States, the first being in Tennessee for tax evasion, the second being for the cryptocurrency allegations for the pump and dump. I was also working very closely with the Spanish legal team and the lawyer from London regarding extradition. Do you believe that your client killed himself? No, no chance. I do not believe that that's what happened inside the prison in Spain. Why? What makes you think that it, it wasn't by his own hand? Because John McAfee said back in October, if he's found dead, it's an Epstein. There is no indication that John was the type of person who would kill himself. He was a fighter. He'll, he'll always be known as a fighter. And the coincidences of the timing and the fact that nobody was in his jail cell and the fact that we can't get straight answers from the Spanish prison all lead to the fact that I do not believe he killed himself. But the fact is, um, he was a fighter. He was a strong man, no question about it. He was also a free man. And the prospect of spending his entire life, uh, potentially, uh, behind bars in the United States did worry him. I just want to play you the last known video of uh, John McAfee. Uh, and here he is addressing the Spanish High Court. If I am extradited, it is certain that I will spend the rest of my life in prison because the United States wants to use me as an example. Está exagerando conscientemente una pretendida militancia política para encubrir lo que presuntamente dicen los Estados Unidos que es un rebelde fiscal, no es otra cosa. Nishay, did he ever uh, communicate to his Spanish team or to yourself uh, that he'd be uh, willing to take his own life to avoid being in a, in a prison cell forever? No, he was comfortable in that prison cell in Spain. We had tried to get him, we were working on the, on the attempts to get him brought over to London, but he has never once indicated that he would take his life. In fact, he said the exact opposite, that he wouldn't take his life, and that if he was found dead, it was at the hands of either the Spanish uh, prison or other people who do not want him to talk in or addition, to come back to the United States. Right, and in, in addition to that, can we just talk about uh, the charges he was facing, first of all. Um, can you just explain the, the two charges, the two sets of charges in Tennessee and in New York? So in Tennessee, he was charged with tax evasion for not f filing tax returns or for hiding income that should have been filed as tax returns. But, and a lot of it had to do with money he supposedly made in promoting cryptocurrency. The case out of New York, out of the Southern District in Manhattan, was based on the fact that he was taking money not disclosing that he was allegedly getting money to promote different types of cryptocurrency and that his value would go up and then he would dump the stock. Those are the allegations out of New York. So it's two separate sets of crimes alleged in two separate jurisdictions in the United States. Now, what's interesting is uh, he was found dead a few hours after finding out that the, the, the Spanish were accepted an extradition request on one set of charges, the Tennessee... Uh, tax evasion charges, but it wasn't a done deal. The extradition was not a done deal. There was still the New York matter outstanding, and in any case, you had an appeals process ahead of you. Is that right? That's correct. This was the lower court of Spain who allowed the original extradition to take place on the day when the ruling came down. There was still an appeals process to other courts in Spain. The New York extradition matter had not even begun. Uh, there hadn't even been a single hearing or a filing done in that matter other than the initial uh, notification that New York had requested extradition of John back to New York. There would have been at least another year's worth of court battles just in Spain and potentially in London with the Court of Human Rights uh, and to exercise his rights as a British citizen. Because remember, John was a dual citizen, both United States and uh, a British citizen. Mm -hmm. So he still had access to courts in Britain to fight the extradition to the U.S. We had uh, the Spanish lawyers working on it. We had our British attorney working on it. And it would have been at least another year before John ever made it back to the U.S. soil. So he still had hope 
that he could beat this, perhaps uh, go to a, another country. But in order to, to believe that he was killed in his cell, as opposed to either dying of natural causes uh, or killing himself, you have to believe that the Spanish authorities are performing some sort of cover-up. Would you go that far? Uh, it could potentially go that far. It's not only the Spanish authorities. You have other people in the cell who may have wanted John executed. There's a lot of theories out there. It's just too coincidental with given all the statements that John made on Twitter about if he is found dead, the fact that he's always been a fighter, the fact that he told Janice he would talk to her later, the fact that we all knew that this original court was going to order extradition. This was not shocking news to anybody yeah. on our team, to Janice or to John. Right. So this was all expected. The only question was what day it was going to happen. Well, that's what his wife was saying uh, in that soundbite we just heard. We were prepared for that decision and had a plan of action already in place to appeal that decision. That's correct. All of, all of the lawyers, the team in Spain, the London team, myself, we all had a uh, conference Zoom meeting earlier that day when we knew the uh, ruling had come down. We advised Janice. Janice advised John that we had a plan in place. So the timing is very coincidental that it, you know, the supposed suicide happens on the day that yeah. a ruling from a lower court that still had room to be overturned happens on that day. It's coincidental that his roommate, which he has, doesn't happen to be in the cell at the time this supposedly happens. So we've, requ we've requested video, we've re requested everything. We're just not getting anything. The Catalan Justice Department uh, told Reuters news agency uh, that all signs point to a suicide. Now, as far as I know, and uh, you and the Spanish legal team know, there's, no, there's not been an official autopsy yet. There's been one ordered. We've gotten no results. We've gotten no investigation results. We can't even get a certificate of death out of them. Yeah. So there's obviously something going on. They're trying to dot their I's and cross their T's, uh, knowing them they'll end up crossing the I's and dotting the T's, given that, you know, this seems to be a circus. His wife said um, that he didn't deserve to die in a filthy prison like a caged animal. Can you tell me what conditions were like for him in this prison? As he indicated in his tweets, he was comfortable. He was being fed. He was respected by the other inmates. They called him Papa Bear. Um, so it may have been uncomfortable conditions, yeah. but he was comfortable in his circumstances. That was just the type of person John was. And access to lawyers? Very limited access to lawyers. Communication was limited. They made it difficult for anyone who was not a Spanish lawyer to directly communicate with John. They, we had spent months trying to get a visitation for myself and the London lawyer to meet with him because neither one of us are licensed in this in Spain, so there was problems. Mm. You know, they made his access to legal help impossible. And is we this... believe that was also part of this cover-up. Right. You do believe there is a cover-up here. Um, he wasn't treated in the way that you think would be normal or fair. Uh, can, can I ask you, is this case over for you now, uh, that John McAfee is dead? Or will you help his widow and his, the rest of his family to find out exactly what happened in Spain? My intention is to continue helping as long as they want my help. I've spoken to Janice a few times. I've told her that I'm willing to help. Uh, there's still some things that need to happen in the two matters here in the United States to close those, but nothing can happen in, in the United States until we get a certificate of death, at least in the criminal matters. Now, civil matters in the United States, they could try to go after the estate, which, you know, the IRS is ruthless in this country. Uh, they don't care if you're dead or alive, don't have anything. They'll come after you right. uh, to the point of digging you out of your grave. <laughs> uh, the, the SEC and CFTC matter, those may go away. However, again, they may go after the estate. But the criminal matters, as soon as we get a certificate of death, should yeah. end. Look, e even if it was a suicide, there is clearly a failure here in the Spanish justice system to, to monitor a man and make sure that he makes it to trial or extradition or whatever was awaiting him. So... Is there any legal avenues here to force the Spanish to have an inquiry into this? Well, that's something our Spanish team is working on to find out what happened. We're just trying to get simple answers. We can't even get simple answers right now. Yeah. Uh, we can't even get a confirmation of death certificate out of the Spanish prison system slash government. So the Spanish team will be working mm -hmm. on getting that information, and I will do whatever I can to assist the family in getting to where we need to get to to close this matter. Mark Eglinton, um, I'd like to bring you in, in at this point. Uh, you talk to him every day uh, for seven months uh, on Skype in 2019. 
preparing yeah. his biography, you counted him as a friend. Uh, how yeah. did you react? What went through your mind when you found out that he was, he was dead? Uh, well, I, I was astonished, uh, I have to say. And uh, the sequence of events was that I saw the, the news story about the extradition first and assumed that that was expected. Uh, it wasn't great news, but I assumed it was expected. And only half an hour later, or however long after it was, I, I, I saw the notice that he was dead. And I, I was devastated uh, for a number of reasons. John was a friend of mine. Uh, and also, I've got this, this project that we had together, uh, the, the book that we worked on. One of the things I think he was most excited about and looking forward to was actually reading this book. And he'd said so. He said, you know, when this book comes out, I'm going to support it. Uh, I'm going to give you every support I can with this uh, mm -hmm. when it comes out. And obviously, that's not inconsiderable uh, support, given he has a million Twitter followers. So, I mean, all in all, it was a devastating day, and I'm still reeling from it now. I have to say, it just doesn't add up for me. Do you believe the Spanish authorities? I don't... Well, what I believe is all I can do is reconcile the person I knew uh, and the life he lived and some of the acts he did in the past and put them side by side with what people are claiming has happened here. Now, John is someone who faked a heart attack previously to evade a situation. He faked a stroke in another situation. This is somebody who had a house in Tennessee where he fired shotguns through the walls to the extent that he had to stuff towels in the holes <laughs> in order to keep people who were pursuing him at bay. This is not somebody who would uh, concede to... Uh, a, posi a, a hopeless position, as it were. It just does not add up for me. Yeah. Can I... We have a number of tweets uh, that he put out whilst he was in jail, and mm -hmm. we're going to have a look at a few of them in, in chronological order. So we've already heard one from back in October. But, of course, a lot can happen from October, when he said he would never do an Epstein, and June. But this one is from May, so it's not too long ago. He said, I once had everything. After uncountable lawsuits and the reach of the feds, I now have nothing. But inside these prison bars, I have never felt more free. The things you believe you own, in reality, own you. Now, quite apart from the fact that this is quite philosophical, it does tell you about his state of mind. But do you take that at face value, Mark? Uh, John was a philosopher. Uh, I have to say, a lot of the conversations we had as well as being about his life from uh, growing, well, being born in the UK all the way through to the present day where he was in hiding. A lot of it was philosophy. But uh, I have to say, I don't believe his... Co I, I do believe his comments about his financial status because we had conversations about it and we actually talked about being me being paid for a, a portion of this project that we were doing together, and he just didn't have the means to do it. Mm. It's as simple as that. I mean, he told me that his position was no better than mine. So I think he was philosophical about things. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily read too much into the tweets because yeah. John is somebody who goes with how he feels at any given moment. He, he's that kind of person. He's, he's driven by his emotions, and whatever he feels, he'll put out there. But again, I would reinforce the fact that there is nothing in my relationship with John McAfee that would make me think he would commit suicide. Yeah, and on that note, again, about the potential for suicide, he wrote, Today a man facing a difficult situation asked if I knew of painless ways to kill himself. Having little experience in such, I was of not much help. The amazing thing is that the tone of the discussion was like discussing the weather. Prison is a strange environment. Um, he, you were keeping in touch with him uh, via his wife, Janice. Um, how, how was he coping in prison? John's been in prison before. This wasn't the first time. This isn't somebody who's stressed about the idea of being in prison. He was very comfortable in that environment, as comfortable as anyone can be in prison. Uh, I tried to send some mail to him that was blocked, which I thought was quite revealing, because I had a letter that I wanted to send to him along with a book that got returned to me which would, would add up with what Nisei is saying about how intransigent it appears to be in Spain in terms of communication. But anything I heard from Janice was that John was just doing what John always did. John could adapt to any circumstances, has adapted to any circumstances, and this was no different. That was my understanding. Yeah. I know you've been, as I say, you've been in touch with um, Janice. Uh, we've heard a soundbite from her. She, she sounds distraught. Um, how is she coping at the moment? 
I, I think Janice is distraught, and I can un perfectly understand why. I mean, their relationship was like two teenagers, given, I mean, regardless of their age difference. These were two people who were really deeply in love. I saw that because uh, when we when we talked on Skype, Janice often came into the screen. We always said hello. She was always interjecting in the background. Those two were extremely close. And for, for her to be in this position uh, and feeling like she is, I, I can only imagine how much of a shock this has been for her. And, yeah. and again, just reinforces how completely unexpected it was. Uh, you know, Nishé was alluding to the potential for a cover-up here. And naturally, people are going to say, well, another conspiracy theory and a conspiracy theorist. Pretty much the same with Epstein, except there are some very well-qualified people who don't accept that Epstein killed himself. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the, his enemies. Uh, he's been described as one of the most paranoid men, uh, when I've been talking to some of his associates, that they've ever met. Was he paranoid? Uh, I asked him that question. It's one of the first questions I asked him when we started on our book, because I was looking through his history, and particularly, I mean, if you, if you look at the documentary about the Lees, which was slanted heavily in, heavily in favor of the documentary makers and heavily against John, you could easily be led to believe that he was holed up in the jungle in Belize feeling paranoid. But the, the, the fact of the matter is there was, there was risk to his life in Belize. Equally, the other, the other thing people like to bring up is that antivirus software wasn't necessary, that he made up this idea that viruses existed and were a threat. That's patently not true either. Uh, he has been demonstrated virus existed, viruses existed back in the day, and they still do now. So I think John was somebody who was always on guard. One of his uh, quotes that I enjoyed most was that he said he always has a, a sense of when impending doom uh, presents itself. He always knew when it was coming. But because he knew that, I think he was always on guard for it. I don't think yeah. it was paranoia. I think it was somebody who was always on guard, and, and with good reason. So, so when, I, when he says there are people who want to kill me, that's not a joke. Um, who, who primarily would want to see him dead? Well, l l let's take an example. When he left Belize uh, and had this spell when between 2013 and 2018, let's say, Janice and he were basically homeless in the U.S., traveling around. Now, one of, one of the parts of this story, of course, is that Janice was in touch with uh, one of the entities who was trying to apprehend John and... and they believe that it was somebody who'd been contracted by people in Belize. Uh, bounty hunter, you could call it that. But at that point, that was what was happening. And there was a number of people in the US who were following John around. Uh, and he had to make several quite dramatic escapes, one of them Portland, famously, uh, various car chases around the country. I mean, all of this sounds like movie yeah. uh, material, but really, really it isn't. This is reality. This is what was happening. Uh, and that's part of the reason why, obviously, there was a grand jury, grand jury convened, which caused him to leave the States. But even once, he was, once he'd left the States, there was an attempt to apprehend him in first the Bahamas, later the Dominican Republic. And in both those cases, U.S. authorities were involved. So, I mean, this wasn't somebody who was running around for fun. This was somebody who was evading Here, people trying to collect him. Here's another a tweet. He wrote, I've collected files on corruption in governments. For the first time, I'm naming names and specifics. I'll begin with a corrupt CIA agent and two Bahamian officials. Coming today, if I'm arrested or disappear, 31 plus terabytes of incriminating data will be released to the press. Now, I, I would just like you to take me through his relationship with the CIA. I know that was uh, pretty confrontational. And secondly, if you think it's a credible threat uh, from John, or, or was it just a desperate gesture to protect himself? not sure about the, the gesture, but what I would say is that, I mean, John, going back to his days pre-McAfee, the company, uh, worked for the CIA on a black project uh, after having worked for Lockheed Martin. So he knew how the business worked. And I believe, from what he told me, that the CIA were one of his clients when, the, when he first started his company. So it wasn't like it was an alien relationship. Going further forward, I think John, from what he told me, had contacts within the CIA, some of whom were, were friendly, other, others of which were less friendly. And the impression I got was that there was a bit of to, of to and fro of information whereby somebody would tip him off with information, somebody else uh, would be 
trying to pursue him, and and he'd just keep moving moving around accordingly, according to the information. The the part about the the, the corrupt CIA agent and the the mm. the, the official in Baham in the Bahamas, I think that's in the public domain. I mean, he he, st he stated names at the time. It's in the book anyway. Right. Uh, he he outed this uh, Bahamian official. And my understanding was that it was a CIA agent who was trying to collect him illegally. That's, that's what I was told. Mark Eglinton and um, Anishay Senan, that's all we have time for for now. A lot of issues unresolved, and we're going to come back to you in part two. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes again, please go to our channel on YouTube. And we shall be back on Thursday with part two of the John McAfee story. Thank you. Goodbye.